नजीब Dr Saklan is a PhD in ESL and before he moved to Saudi Arabia he was teaching at uh, uh, he was acting as the director Hamdard University and then he joined Majma University in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia Dr Saklan is an active researcher and his research articles are published regularly in international and Pakistani journals thank you very much for joining us on the session sir uh the next guest guest speaker of the day is miss ambreen shafi ambreen is a strong professional with a masters degree in tissol uh, from nottingham trent university uh she has done her b a honors uh, and masters in english literature from the university of karachi and at present ambreen is working as the head of the english department in fe college in the united kingdom kingdom Thank you very much, Amreen, for joining us on this session. I'm happy to have you here. Thank you for uh, inviting. The, Thank you for inviting me. The next is Rahila Rahila Huma Anwar, who is working as an assistant professor in English and business communication at NAD University of Engineering and Technology. Uh, Rahila is also a PhD candidate at uh, at the same university, and she's completing her PhD dissertation. in applied linguistics focusing on english language teachers emotional intelligence self efficacy and effectiveness uh, she completed her mphil in applied linguistics from hamdard university and ma in english linguistics um, from karachi university and she also acquired third position from the university of karachi thank you very much rahila for joining us today um, our last guest speaker is our very own sir zainul abdi whenever i introduce zain sir i say our very own because i and zainul abdi we work at the same um, uh, college we both are from comics college so sir zain is a senior faculty member at comics and he has been working um, as an assistant professor as well as coordinator of student affairs programs and uh, sir zain has a vast experience of teaching esl learners both at the school as well as at the intermediate level thank you very much sir zain um i'm 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 happy to have some renowned accomplished people from um our field so i would like to start this conversation with dr saklen dr saklen when we released the poster for this particular session um and see the, the the title of this conversation reads like the importance of english um as medium of communication in in esl context a lot of people ask asked me as to why you are being so you you are being so particular about the context why esl context so for my audience i want you to explain uh, the significance of context a little when we deal with english language teaching and learning uh, your uh, first point thank you very much for inviting and your your efforts for uh, the academics your second part of the question wasn't clear can you please repeat about the context part because so the second part of the question was as to why the context is so important when we deal with english language teaching and learning yes thank you very much um, a few things uh, that i wanted to say in, um in, uh, uh, regarding the kind of Uh, medium of communication as such as well when we talk about community in today's uh, era you know the younger generation the generation of uh, it the generation of uh, gadgets they usually take communication as um, the oral communication only and that's the missing part that i believe and i observe in uh, the students these days like for example when we say communication the first thing that people think about people means the the students the youngest students the first thing that they think about is the oral communication it is one of the parts 
of uh, communication, but not the only part of uh, communication. What I believe is that these days students are uh, more proficient in oral, speaking, uh, oral uh, communication, sorry, uh, rather than uh, writing. What I believe is that we, like for me, I would rather divide Uh, communication three tiers or three layers. Number one, the only possible communication. One is the oral communication. Second is communication. In written communication, these days we have two different variations again. One is the communication through IT or ICT, you call it. And second is real time written communication. And of course, all these three types of communication have uh, a different needs, different, uh, uh, yeah. Well, there are three different genres, you know, and they need to be understood clearly. Uh, we, uh, what I observe is that in the process of being um, literate in kind of uh, language, we, uh, I observe that people or the students are becoming Americanized and now when I say Americanized, I mean that the the difference between 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 formal communication informal communication dual communication is getting thinner and thinner every day like the way you started the session was very formal but if you give this uh, 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 responsibility to a new younger student he would be using a vocabulary which is these days you know but when we talk about the communication in context of ETL, we need to understand you know the difference and the needs that, that we have rather than copying the people uh, that are in english in english language you know for example when there's a guy who is uh, a speaker or like these days in Pakistan, we have so many uh, motivational speakers, some are just to use the word. Uh, they might be so good at speaking, but it does not mean that they do not need to be proficient and absolutely immaculate in written communication as well. I'm not talking about only written communication, through IT, but written communication on paper as well. All these have different conventions. Number two, when we talk about ESL, there is a basic misconception between ESL and EFL. English is a second language and English is a foreign language. Believe you me, in Pakistan, all the students are so lucky that English is their second language. Here in my world, where I am teaching and dealing with of language, it is absolutely different environment to, to, to deal with the language as a foreign language. Um, of course, when one of which changes, of course, our handling with the language also changes, of course. It is easier. What I've observed it is easier to, you know, for example, let's talk about the pronunciation thing. It's easier for a learner of English as a second language to uh, follow the pronunciation. I'm not talking about the accent, but the pronunciation. But when we talk about uh, those people who are who are uh, with English as a foreign language, it is absolutely difficult, very difficult task for them to switch from their first language to suddenly a foreign language and try to develop the same kind of phonetic system in their in their own uh, mind it becomes so difficult so phonics of course it's very important in terms of uh, um, english language teaching or learning both uh, thank you very much dr sab your voice was breaking so we, we couldn't clearly get what you were saying but i'll get back to you in a while uh, Amreen, you have experienced two different contexts. Like when you were studying in Pakistan, sure. that was definitely an ESL context. And now you're working in a context which is referred to most of the time as ENL context. So how mm -hmm. would you uh, 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 highlight the difference between the two contexts? What are the challenges that learners and teachers face in, in both the contexts? 
Yeah. Well, thank you very much. First of all, I would say thanks so much for inviting me, and I really appreciate your efforts. You're doing a fantastic job, so keep working with the same zeal. Um, I hope this session is going to be very productive, and we could, do, you know, share our insights, and that could be meaningful for the people who are watching us. So, first of all, when you're talking about the ESL context, English, we take it as, you know, of global importance. Okay, which is something which cannot be ignored. So I will be able to highlight the importance of English both in terms of teaching and learning as well. So when we talk about the effectiveness of language, we do have to face a lot of challenges as teachers. And I feel like the challenges with the students feel as well. OK, so it's not just worth one thing that we are. We as teachers are only following the, you know, kind of experiencing the challenges we have the students. And now, considering teaching, you know, here in the UK, we we have students who come from a diverse background. Okay, so that is one of the things. When they come in here, they've got a lot of expectations. They have to face challenges, and the first challenge which they come across is a cultural shock. Mm. They are exposed to a very different way of teaching and learning, and when they come in here, it's something very new. And our focus as language teachers is all about students comfort, learners need. And we have to go through the whole process of giving them equal opportunity, you know, keeping in mind the GDPR, the risk assessments and all. So it's all the initial phase, which we kind of keep in mind in order to have a very smooth learning, in order to achieve their aim, what they're expecting from us as practitioners. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. yeah, so this is one thing which we, we come across. But when we have the students, we make them to go through the initial assessment process, where in fact we are individually interviewing them and kind of finding them what is their purpose and aim to learn a language. Sometimes the students have got a lot of expectations from the teachers and they say, we, we just want to learn English really quickly. That's one of the reasons we are here in the UK. So some students have got very short term, very specific roles, and some students are easygoing. So it's just like both what we could say, we have to look into things from the challenge point of view, where the teachers have to make lots of changes when they are making a scheme of work. It's not like a set curriculum that we have to follow through for all the students. It's quite different here in the UK. Students come first, their needs, their goals, and then their achievement. So I think there is a lot which the teachers are doing from their part, but it, it's been a smooth process once all things is done, you know, completely in place. So okay. I feel like, yeah, that, that's what's been happening and we've been dealing really well because the students come in and the first thing they ask is, are we going to be proficient speakers soon? And they feel like when the teachers are coming in the classroom, they've got a magic wand. And the teachers mm. are going to say abracadabra and all of a sudden <laughs> they're all going to be proficient writers, speakers and all. Well, this is actually not the case, to be honest. We have to keep a very, uh, what we could say, clear picture for the students and for us as well. And in the same way, that's how I train my staff as well. All right. Uh, so probably whatever Amrita said, it, it, it brings us to the question of, you know, L2 motivation. Raila, you are teaching at the NAD University of Engineering and Technology. We teachers, you know, we keep on insisting that students should be speaking the second language. They should be able to communicate in English as 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 soon, uh, at least when they are in English class, at least when at when when they are studying subjects like business communication. So we are fully convinced of the importance of English as 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 uh, medium of communication. What about our students? Our uh, are they aware of it? Do they like communicating in English at the university level? Yeah, thank you, Rooj. Uh, can, am I audible enough? Yes, yes, you are. Yes, you are. OK. Yes, at university level, you know, students are really convinced. And uh, they are actually very much motivated intrinsically and extrinsically in both ways, because they know the of this language globally. And they also know without it but you know then despite of being motivated and they know the importance of this language they face a lot of challenges you know and because of those challenges they become reluctant maybe they forget they forget about you know what their goal is and why they need english and you know sometimes they try to shy off maybe they are not that 
extroverts in the classroom they don't try to you know speak while the teacher is trying to bring them into their communication process and the reason is because uh, you know we have so many challenges you know wh when we talk about higher education you know you cannot detach higher education from the previous background that the students are bringing from schools and colleges so you know the challenge begins from the school level and the college level, and then we face you know these uh, you know detached and disturbed students who are actually motivated and they want to take english as a serious subject because obviously they know it's globalization and that language english is a lingua franca but at the same time they have a lot of reservations and a lot of challenges that they have to face and we being teachers in higher education we not only have to teach the students in a subject context only that we have to teach them english but rather you know we have to deal with the 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 effective factors you know the psychological side of the students as well because you know you cannot just leave their own although, although we have very huge classes when government sector despite of that you know we have to be very particular about you know we have to come down to the level of the students and we have to the psychological problems that the student is facing in order to make the student fully participate and you know take advantage of this subject but then if you talk about the challenges you know i can keep on going and i can keep on talking about the challenges that students face and that they bring with them as baggages to the university education which is mandatory at the university level to have you know english language uh, instruction in the classrooms but uh, you want to say something yeah which? yeah there, there is one thing that i would like to add see probably we can't really blame the kind of school students come from because we i and zensa we are teaching at private college where students most of the time they are coming from good schools but even then it becomes you know an uphill task to make them communicate in english all the time zensa i i i i uh, hope you, you would agree with me that becomes course, really I, yeah, really an uphill task that no actually that. i i can i continue or uh... yeah no you please 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 continue yeah actually you know i have not once blamed the school or the education system in the country not even once but you know we have to agree with the point that you have a disparity when it comes to school education yeah and the college education you know uh, you, you cannot just ignore the fact and you know there are students that we are getting they are actually having they are facing the, these disparities that we have in our education system even now you know because we are trying to have a kind of you know um, conflict in the linguistic you know um, setup that we have in our country so i'm not blaming the schools but yeah this is a reality and you know we we need to it's just you know uh, we have to realize what are the gaps in the society or the education setup that we have and being at higher education maybe we can have more research and more you know insight into you know finding out what the problems are lying at these at the grass in order to cater those problems and coming to your point you know despite of coming from very good schools they are not trying to intermingle uh, the reason is that you know despite of being in very good schools i don't know what you call very good schools but you know uh, why, when the students are not given a chance to communicate obviously they would never take this opportunity to be open and you know and to talk in that language so you know i don't know what 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 is the definition of a very good school that is another debate but mm. uh, i think yes by, they can be challenged uh, by, mm -hmm. by by very good school i mean to refer to private sector school where students uh, no. are paying high again you would say i'm blaming <laughs> the education system i am not I i'm just trying to <laughs> see deep down what is happening you know but you know when you talk about private system you know um, uh, you would agree that you know in our private schools we again have a disparity you no know, we have hmm. elite private schools and we have mohalla private you agree with me yeah and mm -hmm. there is a big disparity again in them so you know the first thing that you know okay if i go into the challenges that the students are facing in higher education and to rectify them and uh, all that you know first thing that so the challenge the first challenge that is coming to our education you know is not having equity you know we need to have mm. equity, not equality equality we need to have equity in the education system so students are motivated your question that and they are aware of the importance of the language but then they have a lot of you know issues that they bring with them so maybe um, until and unless we are not researching we are not trying to investigate the problems that are lying at the grassroots level maybe we as language teachers if you are only talking about the language teachers specifically i think we need to be very particular about the psychological phases you know they are going through mm. and maybe we can bring to the, uh, them to that level you know if you would like i would share i would like to share a story of my and the, the student that i was teaching in one of the departments at my university and after some some years the student came back to me 
and the student told me that i am an author of several books at oxford university press and uh, the first book that I, that i wrote was after your motivation so you know they mm -hmm. are already motivated you know but uh, they only need a push and they need uh, an assurance from the teacher and it has to be a mentor and you know uh, a teacher has to uh, uh, have a rapport with the student so there are several other factors that is a very big debate you know in fact my phd research is in all these fact the factors so i can keep on you know talking about the that the students face and the teachers and even the teachers at higher education are facing so um, if you allow me i can continue i'm going to i'm going to float more questions yeah. towards okay, you uh, sure. in a short while but let me so, take sorry, this question Ruiz, to Jensa. I don't want to intervene. Sorry, Ruiz, I just want to intervene because we are talking about motivation. So if you just let me just to highlight one point, when we're talking okay. about giving some opportunity, would you allow me? That would be great. Yeah, yeah, because please. then we can extend yes. it from there. You know, when we talk about giving, when we talk about motivation and giving a lot of opportunity to students, then we take about, you know, as teachers, as language teachers, we talk about our style, our way of teaching. Now the approach has moved from a traditional way into a very communicative way of teaching and learning, mm -hmm. okay? And I feel like with this approach, students have been given a lot of motivation, a lot of support, where they are actually bringing their points and sharing that way. So of mm -hmm. course, their communication is improved a lot. So that is one of the factors which I feel like kind of lacking is still in some of the areas as I was talking about the diversity before that the mm. students are coming out where they are very much exposed to a traditional way of teaching and learning or lecture based but it has mm. taken you know a very good turn into this communicative way now okay where the students I, I, are highly uh, motivated and as, as I'm just saying, I was saying you know so the motivation <laughs> is coming from in I would I would second what Amreen is saying. She's very much right, you know, and uh, communicative language teaching and the student centered approach is very much, mm. you know, uh, something that we should all be following. But, you know, we have uh, in our context, again, I'm not criticizing uh, because we are researchers and, you know, we have to research more and we have to bring these things into frontline and, you know, have to deal with mm. the things that we are facing as third world country. So, yeah, these are very much there, the student centered approach and uh, communicative language teaching and all that. But still, you know, we are still struggling to bring these things into our education system because mm. I would, you know, say that we are still maybe, maybe, maybe I am doing that. Maybe Ruju are doing that, but not every teacher is still very much aware of these methods. And maybe we are unable to bring them into our classroom. So, you know, that we have to bring it here. There is and, I believe this is, uh, and I believe this is where the teacher education comes in. If we are yeah. training the teacher in the right direction, you know, as Right. supervisors as mentors then this in, is going to be very helpful in that way in in our context when we talk about english as medium of instruction it's not only for the subjects like english and business communication uh we we refer to other subjects All. as well where, where english should be serving as medium of, in, of instructions that probably this is where we we, oh. we lack because english teacher is the only one probably who teaches in english who speaks to her or his students in english but definitely that they do, the students don't really find the same exposure when it comes to other subjects. Then, sir, what would you say about it? What are the challenges yes. that we are facing in our real Thank physical classrooms? Thank you very much for calling me, first of all, your own business. We are from the same institution. So, coming back to this topic that you have, uh, you know, which is there, importance of English as a medium of communication in the ESL context. So, we see that, yes, medium of communication is going to give them that input which is required to learn or to improve this in, without input you cannot be learning anything the input has to be there so if yes esl environment context if we talk about and if there there are there are communication is being made in english and people are communicating in english be it like you know whoever you talk about the teachers of english or other teachers definitely it's going to help and support their language acquisition whether we talk about the first language we know that that language acquisition is important and how it goes this thing has to be there and then automatically there is going to be speaking and yes what uh, Dr. Saklan was talking earlier that there are so many things that are significant and important in that. It's not only one thing in that context. So what we need to understand that yes, English as a medium of communication is going to be very fruitful in the ESL context. But coming back to what you were talking about the challenges, yes, the challenges are really great. And Raila, I won't be blaming, like, I would say the same thing, not blaming anyone, but yes, 
Uh, I'm so sorry. I used the word blame because probably Raila took it seriously. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's okay. It's absolutely right. So I just thought that we should be, you know, uh, talking about it. No, we have to think of like when we do the needs analysis and all. We need to understand the kind of students that we are getting and the challenges that they come with. You know, a lot of people starting even going to university and having done all these qualifications when it comes to learning of English, what what they have learned. It's like uh, you you do understand what is happening in the country, or uh, you know at least in our country in our context. So this is very important and significant that the, as uh, uh, is highlighted by Marine also, the teachers' training comes in there as well. They should be able to understand the challenges that the students are coming with, what are their problems, and we need to uh, you know uh, address them as well. And at the same time, another important thing that yes, we are living in a country where a lot of people. Uh, you know, teach their sub. I mean, English as as a subject and not as a language. Not so, as a language. They, not as a language. That's one issue that we have. Another challenge that we have over here is that uh, uh, it's it's my twenty seventh year of teaching, and I have seen a lot of very good teachers otherwise who teach in English. I'm uh, oh, sorry, where even the English teacher is communicating, not only communicating but teaching everything in Urdu. And I was uh, just searching through YouTube. Many there are many. You know, uh, videos available on different, you know, uh, the things that have to be taught to the students. But every explanation that is made is like literal translation of the poem or the text, whatever they have to teach, and that's it. So we are living in a, this kind of an environment where all these students, as Radhika has very rightly talked about, that this diverse diversity is there. Yes, yeah. what Ruj was saying when she meant people, uh, uh, you know, what she meant by uh, good, uh, you know, uh, private schools, schools where yes, they the students know the language, not only the where they're paying high to learn language, exactly, and they're learning it, and they come with you know some background of that. But then yes, there are institutions and schools where some of these students coming with this challenge also that they have never started language as a language and rather as a subject. Where the medium of instruction, or uh, I mean, not only communication, but medium of instruction is, was even only. So these are the challenges that definitely our students have. Yes, you were saying right. something. Yeah. And now the next question is for Dr. Saklan. Dr. Saklan, like uh, I would uh, like to ask you as to how yeah. you perceive the role of learners' native language when they turn to learn a second language because what i have seen over the years students who do not perform good in english they are the same students who perform equally bad in urdu so how do you perceive the role of uh, students learners native language when uh, they are learning a second language like english in our context yes uh, well um, you know your question has two aspects to it number one somebody who is not doing good in english and uh, not doing equally good in urdu either second thing that i believe is i hope i'm not lagging because i don't know what's wrong today the the, the net the, your voice is lagging uh, am i audible enough before i yes 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 you are further? please continue you are audible all right all right thank you so one yeah one is that uh, a child, a student, a learner who is not doing English and, and nor is doing good in Urdu, number one. Number two, is he doing good in other uh, subjects? Academics, general. Mm. If yes, it means that there's something wrong in understanding the learner's intelligence. You know, if there's a student, if there's a learner who is not doing good at all in uh, his academics, it means that he has landed into a wrong discipline of academics. But if he's all right, right in his academics in general, he is doing good in languages. I, I, I stress languages. As it means that we as educators need to understand his set of intelligence. Does he have, does he possess strong intelligence of linguistics or not? If the student is not equally good in any of the languages it means might be he his logical intelligence is stronger than his linguistic intelligence 
sentence or he is an introvert or he um, you know he has stronger interpersonal communication rather uh, uh, intrapersonal intelligence rather than interpersonal intelligence now the other thing is that in uh, uh, like pakistan and india etc we uh, have stamped i would stress again that we have and english uh, communication as only speaking traditions talking to people etc etc but communication because the topic is not medium of instruction the topic is medium of communication so we yeah. need to understand that's my perception uh, and uh, i'm always open to any kind of criticism of course yeah so um uh, what i believe is that communication has different aspects it is a learner who is an introvert or who is not comfortable in facing 100 people maybe 50 people in a class or a hundred people in a lecture hall and he is not and and he is being judged on his confidence or speaking skills only rather than his language skills we we all know that the speaking is not the only language skill in, in that we have so the first thing is the criterion of judgment to the students need it needs to be by judge the teacher himself number 1 number 2 i have this perception my might be right or wrong i don't know right that a, a somebody who is not good at any language maybe english or any language is necessarily he shouldn't be even good in academics because he doesn't know the language. if somebody is teaching let's say for example in my part of the world if somebody is teaching statistics in arabic because i believe um, uh, because i belong to the kingdom of saudi arabia so that's the problem here if somebody is teaching statistics in arabic and he is performing so good and i am teaching the same subject in english and he is performing bad it doesn't mean that he doesn't know statistics the same go so first of all we need to understand the soft intelligences a learner does possess number 1 number 2 do i have am i equipped with all the required skills of teaching english as a second language or no one common complaint that i heard when i was associated with usaid one common complaint that uh, the teachers uh, came up with was that our textbook do not have any room for teaching english language rather we teach these books we use these books only as source of information for the examination which we proved wrong in that training grounds throughout the country and we told them we trained them how to use your own, own text book for for english as a language in uh, pakistan it's second language in uh, here in, in the kingdom is foreign language so um, you know if a, 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 a student isn't performing well in either of the languages the, the, the responsibility comes on us as educators not to only understand the student sets of intelligences but also to you know see us we have the required uh, tools and tips to handle such students or not and of course it comes back to us we will uh, we can improve more and uh, we can do better that's what i think all right uh, uh, amreen ruj sorry um, could i just so, add yeah could i just no, i want just to let, add let one me point ask let me ask you a question Oh, let, let me ask you a question and then you can add you know whatever you want to say right now see sometimes i feel guilty that uh, we most of the time when students are engaged in the process of learning you know a second language we tell them to to shun their native language so what do you people do in in, in context like uk do you people go for additive bilingualism or subtractive bilingualism what is your approach uh, what your approach is yeah. like when uh, when you are teaching that's a very a good question language? yeah and i was Okay, that's a very good question, uh, Ruj, and that's what I really wanted to share uh, when Dr. Sa was highlighting the point. This is what happens, you know. 
we we can't compare and judge students from their L1 proficiency with their L2 proficiency. That's one point. We do have number, you know, we do have number of students uh, who have a lot of influence, you know, who are influenced with their first language. And they bring that in the classroom as well, in the L2 setting, you know what I mean? But what happened is we, they, that's a very strong point. We have to divert their attention. We have to bring them from the L1 into the L2, which is quite challenging as well. And that could be done through different ways. Sometimes they are very hesitant, okay? They don't want to share. Sometimes pronunciation, I think he, he was highlighting that point as well, that becomes one of the hindrances. They don't want to participate because they feel like, oh, if we, if we will say something, that would be wrong. They don't want to share um, it. Ambreen? So that's something we face as well. Yeah. Is, is, is this what you call immersion method, like, like sink or swim method? We have read about it uh, in our applied linguistics Let's books. Yes. Yeah, you know, this is what this is how it all comes on the teacher, keeping in mind the learners need and what methods and what things they can bring in the classroom in order to have effective communication for the learners and for the teachers to, you know, to plan the lesson accordingly. So it all depends and it works really well. All right. Yes, yes, Raila, what, what would you say about it? Additive, additive bilingualism or yes, subtractive bilingualism? You, yes, you are right. No, definitely, you know, uh, you cannot just uh, do away with the first language when it comes to our context, Pakistani context, because, you know, it becomes easier. Because uh, we, we don't have, uh, we do have diverse uh, students coming from diverse backgrounds, but diversity is not that big. Because usually, you know, uh, students, even if they have their first language as something different, they would be having Urdu as their second first language, you know, uh, 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 they would be bilingual with Urdu as well. So in our mm -hmm. case, it won't be that much a problem. And I don't agree with, you know, uh, having deleting your first language from the context completely, because sometimes you need to bring it, you know, to bring that confidence to the students as well. You know what happened with me when I was a new um, teacher. So I never used to, you know, uh, say anything in Urdu. I never used to use Urdu in my classrooms. And, you know, after some time when I became more experienced, I learned that using your first language with the students actually gives give them a kind of confidence. You know, once a student came to me and I was talking to one of my colleagues in Urdu and the student was really surprised, ma'am, you can talk in Urdu as well. So, you know, and then, you know, I uh, with, with passage of time and being more experienced, I learned that if a teacher is, you know, giving a more comfortable environment in their class, it's good that students become more closer to the teacher because that is the first thing that you need uh, a student need to be once the student is learning from that teacher. So they become more comfortable and they would be able to share with you as well. Uh, it does not mean that we would be teaching English in Urdu, but, you know, we would be providing them that confidence that, OK, if they are, you know, having some problems somewhere. So at least while we are communicating, while we are speaking only, obviously not in written exams, but if we are communicating in the classroom, we are having a group communication or a class communication. Yes, they can express their points in, you know, a bilingual fashion where they can code switch as well. Mm -hmm. At least they are participating in that way. At least they are coming mm -hmm. up. At least they are not shying away. At least they are not sitting that, OK, because we cannot use certain words in English. So we are not going to participate participate at all in the classroom. So, you know, I have learned with my experience that, yes, uh, we need to uh, not, uh, you know, frighten them away by this fear of ha uh, not knowing the second language and, you know, having problem when they have to express their ideas. Sometimes we have to give them that th this is this is a kind of a climber you can use, you know, you, you can use second language and that will you know, help them. So and another point is, you know, uh, the same thing that you're talking about when you come to apply to this. Obviously, uh, we, we should not be correcting them. We should not be judging them. You know, a judgmental teacher cannot make a student to learn, you know, let them make mistakes and not judge them and let them be what they are. And, you know, uh, eventually, you know, accuracy will follow fluency. This is what we know. So let them do, let them swim but, into it. But, but, yeah. but Raila, you would agree that in a context like Pakistan, in, in ESL context like Pakistan, there is too much pressure on, on, on producing uh, accurate utterances. Like whenever you make mistake or you mispronounce a word, definitely people, people would look at you as if you, you, know, you, you have done something you know, really wrong. As if it your reputation... Uh, yes, your, your... I do understand that, but you know, but in in your own classroom, you are the champion of your classroom. You would set the tone of your classroom. You know, you set the tone of your classroom. 
so let the students have this kind of environment somewhere else but at not in the language classrooms they know you know they would make you a role model and you know if you are allowing them to have you know wrong structures or maybe uh, you know somewhere they are uh, not very good with the pronunciation or something so they they would say okay our english teacher is okay with that that means it's it is something okay because you know they would take as champions in the field or maybe uh, the authorities in the field so you are uh, you would set the tone of your classroom so you can do that at at least your own at your own end okay this, this confidence they will carry out of the classroom as well okay zain sir i uh, i want your input on this don't you think that not only for learners we should have the same policy for teachers who are not teaching english like teachers who are teaching maths physics and the other subjects they shy away from speaking english because they believe that if they mispronounce a word or if they you know construct a sentence not not really correctly the students would laugh at them or the other teachers would laugh at them so i think we need to change our approach towards uh, english language learning and teaching so you're absolutely right on that but i want to speak before also because what anila anna said was absolutely correct that is we need to understand that first of all what is our aim if you are thinking of uh, you know accuracy right in at the very beginning It's not going to work. We'll have to make them because it depends on the students. Like if your learners is, is, are such who are shying away, who are not talking, yes, you are going to be flexible with them maybe, and you are going to allow them to speak. And as uh, uh, Rahila puts it, yes, if if they are saying something, making an effort to speak in English, yes, initially they are going to make mistakes, and there are going to be you know some code switch, code switching, or some use of some words from their first language or second or whatever other language. That they want to, so that's absolutely fine. So what and see, there is there there is one more thing we teachers and learners we need to realize that English, the status of English in in global uh, scenario has changed. Like English is now being treated as as lingua franca, contact language, where probably exactly. accuracy matters less uh, than uh, uh, proficiency. If you are intelligible to others, probably uh, you are doing uh, it correctly. You are speaking it correctly. What do you say about it, Amreen? How do you people treat? Uh, I would like to say just one thing. Yeah, yeah, you, please. Amreen. So, uh, Sir Dan Sir was exactly saying the same thing. What we need to understand that his proficiency or pronunciation is definitely there, but then you have to teach them, you know, accuracy at some level as well. Because when it comes to examination or when it comes to, you know, uh, things that they have to do in life with the language, yes, we need to teach them and we need to correct them. And yes, what is the aim? Are we starting with the communication class where we want? to encourage them and motivate them to speak and only speak or we are really thinking of that yes the language structures are important and yes vocabulary is going to come in as well and they have to be good in that also so yes i i just wanted to say the same thing what sir clan sab had earlier said that we need to understand that it's much more than that because if we talk about the native language uh, native te speaking teachers of course they they come with that pronunciation which is definitely there one uh, you know important said that they have with them and a lot of students who are exposed to uh, say west or you know because of social media they are going to be very good when it comes to communication but what they write is going to matter a lot also so at some stage we are going to look at that as well but yes i agree to that extent that initially accuracy is not something that we are going to be demanding from students who are finding it very difficult and they are really struggling but once that stage is over Yes, we have to give them that confidence to, uh, and then correct them as well in whatever way. Of course, not doing the, I mean, not like red pens and all that technique. But yes, we are going to be making sure that somehow they impress. And one more thing that I would like to say, Ruchi, yeah, you talked about the maths teacher and the other teachers, and you mentioned that that earlier. So I think that yes, and that's exactly what we say to our students in our classroom as well. That the classroom environment is, I mean, such. we all can make errors we can all make mistakes definitely so there is no issue with that and even the maths teacher physics teacher if they are going to speak in english of course that's going to be something and additional thing with them and they may not be you know because ultimately the students are going to write in english like interesting is in, in, interesting thing is that we make mistakes while speaking urdu and we don't feel embarrassed <laughs> we should that made a lot but we have to correct them at some at some level please you were talking to abreen i guess so Uh, Amreen, is 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 yeah, teaching okay. uh, yeah. sentence well, construction really important? How 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 you people teach grammar to your students by by inductive means or by deductive means or by yeah, what that's means? That's what I want to say. Like, it's a very interesting talk about accuracy and fluency. How we approach it when the students are near. You know, we've got different level learners, learning with different pace. You know, different uh, pace with different ability. 
So what happened when they come in the classroom, some of them have got a very solid grounding of grammar, okay? And they can straight away go into the activities where they can perform really well. But then we were talking about, we've got hesitant learners, okay? Where they're not very good with their language and grammatical aspect, but they still want to communicate. So one way what we approach is we go for the fluency part as well, okay? So where the focus is not just on the grammar, it's just like they're in a habit of speaking. They should speak in order to come out of this hesitation of speaking in English. Do you know what I mean? Because when we are speaking, we have to worry about a lot of things. We've got the pronunciation, we've got the tone, we've got the intonation, we've got the style. So we have to bring in everything for the students, for them to be effective and proficient learners. So once they have got, got the hang of fluency, they, they can focus on the grammatical aspect as well, which is accuracy. But then they look for the feedback, which is very important. And yeah. I feel like sometimes with adult learners, they feel offended if you are giving them the feedback there and then. So one way how we approach is we give them anonymous feedback which is a delayed error correction. So in that way, we're not kind of suppressing them to, to just develop the fluency, but they are getting the feedback in order to move to the process of accuracy in the later phase. So okay. delayed error correction is like, you know, when they are having, because normally we don't have a traditional classroom. We have different groups working with different capacity. They are interacting with each other, where they are learning with the peers. They're getting the feedback from the teachers. So what happened when we are listening and moving around the classroom, we anonymously wrote everything down. So we've got their errors in there, and then we display and discuss with the whole class anonymously. So they've got the feedback. That's one way of providing them the feedback. And they gain confidence where they don't feel offended. Oh, my point or my mistake wasn't in front of the whole class, but actually they know that it was their mistake. So that they, they can rectify in the later phase when they have to speak and communicate in class. And for accuracy, that is something where we can give them, you know, one on one feedback as well. But then again, that could be something that could be given anonymously. All right. Amrit, what if I ask you as to uh, how long does a learner take to to gain native like native speaker like proficiency? Yeah, so well, this is what again, you know, when I kind of started there, there is no certain time. But the thing is, like, it all depends on what course they're on because we've got different courses, we've got short courses as well. But I feel like it's not just the teacher's part because when they are coming in, they have already set their goals, they know we are teaching them learner autonomy as well. You know what I mean? Mm. We have yeah. got a team of work where we are m working and making learners prepare to achieve their goal. But on the other hand, is the learners as well. It's just not one way process. So in order mm. to have effective communication, in order to develop prof proficiency, they have to be working equally hard. So this is the first thing which we teach them. Oh, look, we have done our part. Now it's your part to take it on board and to focus on your autonomy as well. What can right. you do? So one practice is done within the classroom. Are you going to be practicing outside the class in order to achieve your goal or aim? So that's, right. I think it's, it's quite handy. So it's just like the students part as well, where they have to be you know, actively participating and then practicing it outside the classroom setting. Mm. All right. Uh, we, we're, not gonna be, we're not going to be using any, any portion. <laughs> True. Dr. Satyan, a question came to my mind related to Kachru's three concentric circles. We talk about ESL context, ENL context, and EFL context because countries, you know, this this distinction has been made by Baraj Kachru. So uh, I would like to ask you whether this, this distinction characterization are really valid, still valid? And what do you say about, uh, what do you think, shouldn't we be introducing English as lingua franca to our students these days, so as to give them confidence. Well, the sound is uh, lagging, but uh, uh, what I understood is introducing English as a lingua franca to the students rather than categorizing uh, the language, also of language in different stages. Uh, using uh, or introducing English language as a lingua franca. Is that your question? 
Yeah, this was the second part of my question, but yes, you can answer it. I don't That's know fine, you can answer absolutely it. Laggy, but what I understood. Uh, before uh, coming to this, uh, <laughs> okay, um, a couple of things that I, w I would like to comment. Uh, one is code switching. Uh, I guess it's a way uh, different people um, uh, way. Uh, I do not uh, agree with, with code switching, um, especially in the context of PSLA. And yes, if there's any way we we are free to use it, of course, I don't agree with code switching because it hindrances your fluency. That's what I think. Second thing is the examination's point of view. In my opinion, we don't have to deal with English as a second language from examinations point of view that's where uh, we are lacking behind that we are lacking that um we sometimes deal we try to deal english as a language but at the same time we try to keep things from examinations point of view which change our perception or approach of dealing with english as a language rather than an academic uh, uh part of the whole syllabus you know so we need to uh if we need to uh, 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 with english as a language we have to have examination thing away from here um so a third thing uh, i would like to comment is mistakes in urdu when we commit mistakes in urdu if you ask me like for example i have uh, there are so many native speakers that speak different english i i won't say of course wrong english different english with their uh, uh their of uh, the language because it's their native language in the same way if i'm using different urdu i'm not wrong urdu if i'm saying different i'm using different urdu maybe colloquial way colloquial language is always uh, uh, standardized by the natives so if urdu is my native language which in a I'm using a different word which does not exist in Urdu dictionary or Logat as we call it. And I am a native speaker of Urdu. My language is Urdu. I have this freedom of introducing new colloquial words to my. Now, um, there's a concept of EIL, e English as an international language. Uh, yeah. Of course, it, it, it's uh, here in, in the kingdom. Uh, because we deal in, uh, as a foreign language, I never switch my code. Although in these seven years, six years, I have um, learned a bit of Arabic, but I I never do. This. If I start switching my code, the students will take the liberty and they will start using less English and more in the class, which of course is not my aim. Second is that what we have done, we have developed a kind of English language club in the whole um, camp not only my own department but the department of business administration department of islamic studies etc etc we 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 call all the students whoever uh, wants to come and they try to develop language skills through activity you know the the the, the, the same activities that we usually do in a kind of volunteer uh, language club so i i again stress that look many is not only oral communication we are talking uh, about uh, fluency and accuracy in speaking as a mode of communication that is what i believe now in my class i in every in every batch there are maybe four or five students in every batch that those students speak very you know native like pronunciation and with accuracy they speak like, of course, uh, they usually are uh, uh, tilted towards America, so they use American English. So they literally, they, they speak like American with fluence and accuracy. In the first semester, they get very less marks in uh, my course because they, that communication is only speaking, so they get proficient in, in speaking. But when it comes to written communication, they are absolutely zero. And that's what I believe that we make our students communicate in writing as well and we need to let them know the conventions of communication in writing the convent 
actions of formal communication, informal communication, and casual communication. What happens is that the students are so fluent, accurate, and proficient, all three, in speaking. But when it comes to writing, they are so reluctant in not, I'm not talking about sending an email or a WhatsApp message, but writing on paper. That's how we we start learning to write and then we should go to online uh, communication ICT or whatever so we do not uh, we uh, we do not uh, teach our students our students means the Pakistani students because of my origin is Pakistan of course so if we do learn, uh, teach our students to communicate in English in writing as well our students can never match international students that's what I believe all right. So, see, uh, sir, when we talk about the importance of English as medium of communication, by communication, we tend to refer to all four bas basic skills. This is one thing. And I fully agree with you when you say that probably code mixing should not be there or, or a language teacher should not mix codes. But let me tell you that there are certain situations when students come to you and they request you to explain the same thing in their native language. So, this happens. Sir, Zen is smiling. I'm sure he has come across the same situation. <laughs> So my next question is, is for Raila. Raila, we, we talk about communicative uh, language teaching. Can we really employ it in our context when we have deadlines to meet, when you have you know certain topics to cover every semester or every session? Can we really have or can we really employ communicative language teaching? Uh, are you talking about the higher education setup, the public yeah, sector, because, because, the universities? Yeah, yeah. Public sector universities, see, uh, we are trying to do that. But I don't uh, think so. It's a really wonderful uh, job that we could do with the students because, Ruj, you know what kind of or the uh, you know huge classes we have. We have a number of students in the classroom, and we have limited time to cover up the you know the course contents as well that are given to us. So yes, we do try to, but obviously uh, it's not exactly the way communicative language teaching has to be. But in one way or other way, we do try to you know implement uh, somehow something to the students in the classroom but actually it, it is not at all uh, a lecture based class as well okay mm -hmm. so maybe the communicative language teaching norms are not completely implemented yes but to some extent they are implemented and when you are saying that uh, can we do that in our classrooms we can only do them when we can have a classroom which is you know saying that okay we can do something when we have something this so we cannot demand something from the government sector until unless it comes on our way one day luckily so somehow we have to implement that and teachers have to devise their own strategies that how in such a huge classroom where there are 70 students at a time or sometimes 60 students or maybe 80 students sitting in a crowd. So how are you going to you know, make them communicate? And, and there, there are ways, you know, teachers who can employ, teachers who can, you know, keep themselves updated and updated teachers who can think of different strategies. Yes, they can. But then, you know, you have to a teacher herself, you know, should be really motivated and should be able to improvise, you know, on what strategies she can use in that particular classroom. You know, you cannot say that because I have a very huge classroom, so I cannot mm. implement this. So I'll go by lecture method. So this is this can be a, this can't be an excuse for a 21st century teacher that you mentioned, right? So mm -hmm. you have to devise some strategies to come up with some kind of you know technique that you are involving or your students. And you know then there are several ways. You know I have several uh, things that I can tell you, but maybe this is not the right time. That what an effective teacher can do because again that is my research topic as well. So what an effective higher education English language teacher can do in Pakistani context in order to make classrooms really effective, mm -hmm. right? So, but uh, the, the, the goal comes to again to the teacher. Okay, coming to the second point that was, you know, the code switching point, you know, yeah, yeah, when it, Dr. Najib is very much right, you know, in context like where you have uh, speakers from different languages, so it becomes really difficult to code switch. But in Pakistani context, when uh, Urdu is the common, common language, you know, mm -hmm. you can code switch. In uh, my classes, what I do, you know, I can share this one strategy uh, which teachers maybe can follow is, you know, most of the times I uh, allow my students to code switch. But, you know, I'm not the one who is doing that, you know, so that gives mm. them a kind of, you know, relief. And uh, yeah, this is it. So, yes, communicative language teaching, if you cannot implement it completely like it is given, at least you can devise a strategy. So I can, you know, I think a motivated teacher can do a lot of things, you know, and um, I would also want to share, you know, because I have, I'm getting a chance over here to speak and, you know, share my thoughts about, you know, how can we bring some kind of equity to our education system. So I would like to share over here some of the you know challenges I've already shared, but some of the strategies, if you allow me, uh, yeah, Ruj. Please. 
yeah yeah some Go of the some of the, you know strategies i don't i don't think so that um, i i am the i'm very much you know the right person to be doing that but to some extent i'm related to our education and i do see certain things that you know can be implemented and you know implemented and we can in, improve our educational setup at least at higher education we would be working from the grassroots level first of all second thing you know we should have equity in education which you know um, if if you have read dr tariq rehman you know he has been living with this idea that we should have this you know mother tongue language and all that but if then you know all those things you have not come to any conclusion and we were living in kind of uh, you know uh, illusion that we are going to have an equal education system and then we try to somehow come to another result that was you know the, the single national curriculum that is the most yeah. you know talked thing mm. uh, these days so let's see how that's going on but another thing you know we have to when it comes to um, uh, language proficiency and uh, communication yes communication every every sort of communication you know first of all we have to begin with the teachers as well you know we mm. have to train them as well and we have to uh, you know bring them to that level as well that they are also efficient and they are effective in communicating soon because communication is is everything it's not just the four skills that you're talking about you know it's also your uh, gestures your facial expressions the way you are interacting in a society so we need to bring from the teacher level the effective teacher model we have to bring okay uh, if you are talking about english specifically bringing to pakistan and you know at higher education level what i think you know uh, what i have read read in different researches you know we can apply the uh, formula that chinese uh, you know country china people from china they are following you know we have to bring internationalization to our universities like this model is being followed now in saudi arabia dr najib would know that you know we have a lot they have a lot of faculty you know who is coming from different countries so rather than having so we can have you know inter nationalization in the universities not just through the teachers but the students as like more induction from universities of different countries right so that would give another chance for students like amreen just now said that you know students they um, uh, it's up to them that whether when they are going out in the field they are communicating in the language they are practicing or not right right now one thing when you talk about internationalization do you do, do you tend to refer to the hiring of native speakers as language teachers do you mean that not only language teachers not only language teacher they could be teachers of engineering subjects they could be teachers okay. of science they could be teachers of english we could we should have a you know okay. combination and variety diversity in language the exchange of, a healthy exchange yes. of teachers okay yes yes to some extent they should be walking into the classrooms you know not only mm -hmm. teachers i would say students as well more induction of international students coming to pakistani universities you know like we have mm -hmm. a model in saudi arabia we have a model mm -hmm. in china right and uh, i was uh, yeah i was coming to amreen's point like amreen was saying that how motivated the students are when they are going outside in the field and using the language and it all depends on their you know communication in the field their own informal practice that they would become proficient speakers but i would say here that you know in that context they get a lot of chance what about pakistan like how often a student after going outside the esl classroom would get a chance to communicate with other people who are mm -hmm. so using english my students they come to me and they begin with this ma'am we don't have anybody to practice english with what should we do yeah, like whom should we talk to right yeah. so they don't they are yeah. motivated they want to learn but you know so that is the reason you know i'm saying interna internationalization if they would have five students in their class from different communities or different you know countries sitting obviously the uh, lingua franca would be so this can mm. gradually and you know with the passage of time this can because you know you have to accept at least one fact to see this uh, um, see, i i i i most of the time i talk about english as lingua franca because i want to relieve my students of this of this pressure of producing correct uh, correct, correct utterances every time they speak this is you this know is you, you, this is this is a global phenomena now you cannot avoid yeah. it you cannot you know say that uh, it is my wish not to learn english or it is my yeah. wish to learn english you have mm -hmm. to until don't you know make your own language that much progress you know you have to learn the language because you know you have to come into the commercial global market you have to come into the mm. economy you have to have a lingua mm. franca co communicate you know you need to have opportunities you cannot do away by saying that you know that is not my choice because i would favor my own language more mm. then that means you are just detached from the entire world because you know that can't mm. happen so we have to give more oppor opportunities to those who open to doors to them point as well if you don't mind yeah yeah Uh, okay, uh, I mean, I mean, I, I, I have you know a few more questions for you, but uh, I, I would go to Zainul Abdin sir first, and I have you know yeah, some some yeah. questions 
for you because when i was preparing myself for this conversation yes, you were the why. one i just wanted to add one thing urud okay. because we we are Please. we are going in a wide right direction you know but okay. rahila sorry i'm just going to take 30 seconds not more than that you know when rahila okay. was talking about the chinese context you know we mm. we just get about the internalization of the students as well coming from different countries chinese students are exposed to very traditional way of learning they know out of that mm. zone because they been taught in an efl context they they know yeah. that's why they are moving to different universities like in the uk in the usa so they're short of good teachers yes, that's not going to be a very sorry yeah they are they are working on it now you know they are working yeah. on it now they know that they, they have, have started got their own system yeah. yeah they have done it but yeah, now you know it. you and if you see they are opening up their most pro- priorities to move yes yeah this this UK is what is happening the now they've started doing this they have now started okay. doing this you know okay zain sir you wanted to say something yes. i'm sorry yes, i can't wait it's absolutely right i was enjoying uh this for i would like to just come uh, i mean go back and talk about this code switching thing that we started earlier and i am also from the same school of thought as dr sitland that you know i as a teacher don't think that we should be switching the code because uh i it just came into my mind that dr fazia shamim and uh, mr kareem raza khan at university of karachi would always say if you're going to uh, you know uh, translate things or if you're going to say the same thing in other language your students are not going to concentrate when you're speaking at first time because they would know that after some time they can approach you and you would be telling the same thing in urdu so our uh, you know as as an english language teacher it's not only that we have to teach whatever is there the poems and you know whatever the writing skills and all but we have to make sure that the english improves and they are encouraged and motivated to speak and they are motivated to express they would be able to express themselves better this way because otherwise they are not going to listen to us if you are talking in english and they would only listen to you when you would uh, you know allow or do the code switching and that is not going to be very fruitful so this is something that i would like to also tell the trailer there are some people who are uh, already appreciating no no uh, but that depends andrea uh, i know i, I was just going through the comments yeah but, but again again i i told i already told it you know, it's not the teacher who is code switching this and it, it does not yeah, mean I mean, that you are allowing them a platform where they would mm. be communicating with you only in urdu it never happens no. never ever yeah. in my classroom you know they they know you know they have to struggle and they it have to talk happen, to only in english it, it cannot they know they know mm. i said the tone of my class and you know they know that to what level and where code switching does not mean they can come and talk to me their sentences and entire demands in urdu that would they they, they don't they know that the teacher is not going to allow mm-hmm. that and neither am i code switching yeah it's just you know giving them a window you no know, a window right. where you know at uh, least that is understood words they could add. yeah yes it's absolutely clear what emily really said earlier was very clear to me but i just thought in the end that there is somebody like there was a comment yes not completely where, yes no 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 i was just telling you that like because your message was taken not about the code switching otherwise oh. you are getting appreciation of some of the people who are watching us at this time so this is what no, i was telling no, you Okay. If you are going to be my student, uh, so I would tell them if you are going to be my student, believe me, I am not going to allow you to speak to me in Urdu. So don't take it as an easy thing. Yeah, that's not going to happen. That's, that's really good. So, but then there are some. Yeah, it's quite easy things. in the in the context like Pakistan, but yeah, it's very easy in a context like Pakistan. But it's very difficult when you got a diverse students sitting in your class who speak yes. Spanish, French, yeah. Arabic, yes, yes. and then that wouldn't be. So I think that's why we say a complete no to L one, mm-hmm. and we try to, you know, fit everything with the L two. Again, I think Rahila was talking about the same thing when she says that we should have internationalism. A lot, of, a lot of students and teachers coming from other backgrounds, so that they won't have any other choice but to speak in English. Yeah, you know, they they yeah. get to learn then. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Amreen, I have an interesting question for you. See, in uh, every course of MS, are we read about ownership of English, which is widely debated? And you are coming from a context where people apparently own English. So, do they really think of themselves as as owners of English? This is not really related to the topic of today's conversation, but I I think uh, people would be you know keen to know whether people in UK. consider consider themselves as owners of english well do you know what it's an interesting qu- question but it can be a bit controversial as well and i don't want to take things in a you know controversial direction i don't want to offend anybody you know in any way uh, but if i just take it as a very positive point you know when we talk about ownership the way we have an ownership being you know that urdu is mm. our first language that's yeah, always true. there yeah true yeah we own urdu but, yes 
Yeah, yeah. But it's the same way when you're talking about our context in here. Definitely, it's it's there. But when we talk about language, we don't take language as just speaking, you know, mm. just communicating. But language is like we need to know all the aspects of language and then using it. And sometimes I feel like the second language speakers, sometimes the second language speakers and teachers, they are speaking and they are teaching in a better way. Some yeah, reason, true. so it's not like always about the ownership or saying that the mm. native speech, uh, native teacher will be able to speak or teach really well as compared mm. to the non-native. I think this is something very debatable as well. Yeah, true. We could take true. so. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I so don't. So my 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 course, next on Ellen, when let's, first... Okay, I wanted to ask you the last question of this session. Uh, the, the, I'm going to uh, take uh, the same question to Dr. Saklen as well after you have res uh, responded to that. What strategies, Evelyn, do you employ in your classrooms to make your learners learn fa learn faster? Learn faster. Again, you know, it looks it, it, it looks really vague. You know, when we use the term faster, yeah, the there's no yeah, such faster. thing like you know. It all depends. Uh, I kind of coming because back I mean we have crash courses from, happening in Pakistan. Depends. We have we have crash courses happening in Pakistan that learn English in three months, in three weeks, in four weeks. Yeah, they never but, really learn English. Then, this is again what I'm saying. Te teacher, teacher as a facilitator, teacher, you know, as a person that comes in the classroom, of course, is well planned, well organized. But when it comes to learners, learners are coming from different backgrounds, from different learning abilities. So it's not always the case. I think you are talking in terms of a business point of view. But when we take, you know, as a, as a crash course or as something that we have to complete, we base our teaching on the scheme of work, which is designed for a specific learner. Mm. And sometimes it's very helpful because the learner is kind of helping us how we're going to deliver this course to them. So it's not just that one thing that we are going to be just literally throwing everything in their end. And they have to grasp it. So mm -hmm. it's going to be from their end, their effort, because they know they want to, you know, learn English. That's the first question we ask, you know, when we have initial assessment. Why do you want to learn English? What are you going to do when you finish this course? So, you know, mm -hmm. once their aim is clear, why they want mm -hmm. to learn English and they know mm -hmm. they are here for a very short course or maybe for a long course, then they set their target. And I think it True. makes the job of the teacher easier as well you know, to help mm. them to achieve those things. So True. I, I wouldn't categorize under the thing of learning faster or achieving. Mm. I would say it's kind of working together in achieving their goals where they mm. are. They as the students are a great help as well. True. So what would you say about that? What should we do to make our students speak, communicate in English? Dr. Saklen. Did you ask me something? Yeah, yeah, sir. Uh, yeah. I Can have you just please uh, come up with the question again? Repeat. I just lost. Sir, I asked uh, as to what should we do to make our students communicate in English? What strategies can we employ in our classrooms to motivate our students to learn English, to communicate in English? Uh, uh, you mean what strategies? I use in we, we as teachers should be using yeah. yeah you can speak from your own experience all right um look here uh, in the department usually not teach uh, skill-based uh, courses i usually teach specialized courses in linguistics like eco linguistics or um applied linguistics or uh, courses like that. Uh, if you ask me, of course, I never uh, switch my code in the class. Number one, I never do that. Mm -hmm. Number two, of course, for example, if in front of me, there are 30 students, 35 students or 25 students sitting in my class. And I know mm -hmm. that out of these, let's say 25 students, five students would understand me fully when I speak in English and 20 students would not get uh, the full message. And I am also, um, uh, I, I, I am stuck uh, to a point that I will not 
uh, 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 switch my code. What I do, first of all, I keep my class absolutely interactive. I do not have that monologue thing at class. I keep it interactive mm. so that everybody's awake. What happens in my part of the world here in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is that these people are obsessed with the gadgets and when they think that the student, uh, that the teacher is speaking something in a language that they do not fully understand, they try, they try to work work on the gadgets. So I keep them on the tip, number one. Number two, I use my body language more effectively than my verbal language. Why? Because there's a student who does not understand me fully in the language. Instead of which my code, I try to use my body language and also my intonation and my tone to make him understand. Um, it, when it comes to the skill-based uh, courses, like we have uh, listening and speaking one and listening and speaking two and uh, three courses for writing skills, uh, we use different strategies, of course. In listening and speaking, we, we have started using the context, contextualized text for listening. And uh, of course, that will make things easier for them because they can associate themselves with the circumstances given. But at the same time, we, you know, these days in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, they have started giving um, these uh, skill based courses to the local those means to the teachers, those teachers who are good at speaking. And I believe that this is a better strategy because they uh, they are good at English. They have come from usually USA after doing the PhDs on scholarship and there they join. So they see somebody in their own attire with their own roots speaking in uh, English language and they try to copy mm. them better than we, unfortunately, in this part of the world. They try to follow locals rather than the expatriates because they believe that the well, I don't, um, I, I, I never, I'm never scared of the controversies. So there is a very common tweet trend here, Saudi lil Saudin, which means Saudi, Saudia is for the Saudis. And therefore, the strategy that they have developed is that for uh, skill based courses, they have engaged some good local, local. teachers studied mm -hmm. from abroad and returned after doing their PhDs. People like me are more into the specialized subjects. Like, for example, for the first time in the history of the university, we have introduced eco-linguistics, which is an absolutely different course. Like, for example, phonetics, phonology. Phonetics and phonology both combine together in one course. So if you ask me in my class, I switch my code, but I use my tone, my intonation, my body language, uh, with more effect than my words, so that those students who don't understand my uh, language fully, at least I can support it for language. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Suklen. Before I close the session, I would like to ask my speakers if they want to say anything, Thank something you. before we close this this uh, discussion, because we have to, we have gone, you know, beyond the time. Yes, I'm. I'm reading. Yeah, this Rahila, is the topic. Zenta. Yeah, we could just. Yeah, this is a topic which we could just carry on and on and on. Yes, and true. To, you know, true. Just, I agree. It was never ending. But I think I just had a very lovely session in here. Yes. So yes, fantastic, you know, for inviting yes. us. Uh, so we get a chance to meet each other as well and uh, all the people who are listening and bearing with us. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yes, Rucha. I would say, Rucha, a wonderful yes, session, like Rucha. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed uh, all the teachers talking. And thank you. You gave us, you know, a reason to meet. Him. And uh, we would look forward for yeah. more such sessions in the future. Yes, and there are so many things that uh, still are uh, told, mm -hmm. yeah, and left to be told and left to be shared. So we can have more sessions like on teacher effectiveness and trainings and all that, and we can discuss more. But it was a wonderful session. Thanks for inviting. Interesting thing is that we teachers are thank aware you. of the problems that we have in our context, yes. and uh, probably such sessions would help us overcome those problems there would be a time I, I i hope that a time would come when we would be able to make our students speak the second language english fluently because this is the need of the hour thank you very much uh, doc, uh, uh, dr dr saklan um, amreen 
uh, Rahila and Sarzen, thank you very much for joining us on the session. So this is where I would like to call thank it a day. Much. Inshallah, thank we'll uh, come together, inshallah, for uh, some other session. Uh, Sarzen, if you want to say something. I just wanted to thank you and all the other people. We had great, no, not we had great time. So thank you for Welcome, yeah. thank you Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And Allah Good luck for the future. Okay. Well done. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Allah 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 Allah